Return. That's the same thing. Expected return and hurdle rate are the same thing. Okay? Equals risk free rate plus beta times the risk premium. So just to review for the risk premium. Okay? So first of all, basic idea in finance is that if we have more risk, we should expect a higher return, okay? The more risk we have, the higher return we expect, okay? So, when we're talking about the risk premium here, we're talking about the fact that stocks are riskier than bonds, okay? So, if stocks are riskier than bonds, I want a higher return from stocks, okay? Does that make sense? Yes. If I have an investment which gives me the same return, but one is high risk and the other is low risk, which one am I going to choose? Low risk. Low risk investment, okay? So therefore, the, usually the low risk investment we, has a lower return. High risk investment has a higher return, okay? So if we look at the stock market, what has the return on the S&P 500 been? Since, uh, since 1960, right? In 1960, it was here, okay? Then in uh, 2015, it's here, it's 2,000 points. In 1960, it's, uh, you can see the points at the side. It's, uh, this is 500, it's 100 points in 1960, the S&P 500, okay? It's 2,000 points in 2015. So we calculated what was the historical return. This is the first way we can get the premium, the historical return. <coughs> so we calculate the historical return. Does it look like it was a good return on stocks from 100 to 2,000? Does that look like a good return? Yes. Which was better, to keep your money in cash or invest in stocks? In 1960, if you put $100 in cash, you'd still have $100, right? In your, in, under your bed. If you put $100 in the S&P 500, you would now have $2,000. Okay, it went from 100 to 2,000. So, over all those years, that was a difference of 1,900%, okay? But we want to know what's the return, yearly return, okay? So we calculate that the yearly return average could be about 7 or 8%, okay? So then we go and we look at the risk-free assets. If I look at the bonds, what do you think it did better over the last, since the 1960s? If you invested in the bond or you invested in stock, which would you have got more money? Stock, stock. It looks like stocks, right? If we figure this out as about 8% a year, right? Average. But bonds is just 2% a year, or 3 or 4% a year, right? Nowadays it's 2%, but in the past it was higher. So the bond average was 4%. So historical return of stocks is 8%. Historical return of bonds is 4%. Therefore, the risk premium of stocks over bonds is 4%. Okay, so this is also expected return. 
Do you understand expected return? Okay, in the future, if you invest in stocks or bonds, where do you expect to get a higher return? Stocks. Which is riskier, stocks or bonds? Do you know Warren Buffet? Who knows Warren Buffet? Warren Buffet. Very famous investor in the world. Warren Buffet, right? They asked him, he's, got, he's very old, so maybe he'll die soon. So they asked him, after you die, what are you going to do with your money? For your wife and your children, where are you going to invest your money? Warren Buffet said, I'm going to invest 90% of my money in the S&P 500. And I'm going to invest 10% of my money in bonds. Okay? So why? Because Warren Buffet knows over the long term, stocks are going to outperform bonds. Okay? We're going to get a higher return. He thinks there will be always a higher return in stocks than bonds. Okay? So the question is, if stocks has a higher return than bonds, why doesn't everybody invest in stocks? Why do people invest in bonds? And why is Warren Buffet investing 10% in bonds? Why doesn't he invest 100% in stocks? Because of the risk, right? What risk? The risk that I buy the stocks here, and I sell the stocks here. Then I lose money, okay? Does that happen with bonds? No. no. So the reason that Warren Buffet brought 10% bonds is just in case the stock market is very low and his wife and son need cash, okay? His wife needs cash to pay the, for the groceries or pay the electricity bill, okay? What is she going to use for cash here? Is she going to sell her stocks or sell her bonds? She's going to sell her bonds for the cash, okay? So this is how, why Warren Buffet explains that he invested 10% of his money in bonds. Because over the long term, the stocks outperform the bonds, right? But the problem is, you need cash. You need cash for living, okay? So you could get caught that you have to sell your stocks when the S&P 500 is at a low point. Do you understand that idea? Yeah. So this is why he invested 10% of his money in bonds. If the S&P 500 is at a low point and he needs ca his wife needs cash, he's going she's going to sell the bonds and get the cash. So she can hold on to the stock and the stock price will come back up over the long term. Okay, so this is what we're talking about here with the premium. What Warren Buffet is thinking about, okay? There is extra risk for investing in the stocks. Okay, the stock market, the stock market can go down if I buy stocks here or here, right? Or here, it might go down, okay? But usually, over the long term, the stock market is moving up at an average of about 7 or 8% a year, right? But I can invest my money in the bank, in a chunky yogam, some fund, right? Fixed fund, I get 2% a year. It's safer than, than stocks. I can invest in bonds, I get these days 2% a year. It's safer than stocks, okay? So, most people we said earlier have some combination of stocks and bonds in their investment uh, portfolio. Okay? What about real estate? A lot of people also invest in real estate. What do you think? Is real estate as risky as stocks? Riskier than stocks? Riskier than bonds? Safer than bonds? What do you think about investing in real estate? Between. Somewhere between, <coughs> right? <coughs> does the, the stock market went down, does the house price go down as much as the stock market up and down as much? Maybe not, but maybe you won't get as high return, right? So over the long period, the stock market gives better return than real estate, okay? So that's why I'm saying a lot of people, their main investment in their life is real estate, right? They buy a house, they expect the value to go up. But actually over the long term, the S&P 500 is outperforming the, the real estate, okay? But real estate might not be as high risk as, uh, as stocks, right? The price goes down, but maybe not as volatile. It's more slow-moving market, slow-moving market. Usually first the stock market goes up, then the housing price follows, right? 
the stock market goes down and the house price follows more slowly. So with all investments we're talking about risk and return. So we want to have a risk premium for the stock market. How much more is the stock market risky than the bond market? Okay, so we can do this one way, historical returns, historical premium. The second way is the implied approach. I'm guessing what are the returns going to be in the future? Okay, so the historical approach, I look at the returns in the past and I calculate from the past. Okay, the implied approach, I'm, look, I'm forward looking. How much, do, how much are the companies going to grow? What do economists think about the next five years? Okay, are the companies going to make a lot of profit? Pay a lot of dividends? Is the stock price going to go up? What do I expect my return to be in the future? Okay. So these are two different ways of uh, calculating this premium. Okay. Do you have any questions about this premium? No? Okay, so we know the risk-free rate, we know the premium. We should know how to calculate for different countries. Okay? Countries have more risk, we can add on the credit rating. Okay? Finding out where the company does business. Okay, then uh, if Coca-Cola does 50% business in the US, we use 50% of the risk premium in the US. Okay, where else does it do business? We can find out this information. So then we are concerned with this number, which is beta. So we, we started discussing about beta in the last class. We said we use, we, one way we can calculate this is using a regression. <coughs> so there's something that I, I, I just skipped over in the last class because it's a little bit more complicated, we'll talk about now, is uh, Jensen's alpha. We're talking about performance. So, when I make this equation, what I'm saying is that this is my expected return, okay? If I invest in Disney, Disney is very similar to the S&P 500, it has a beta of 1.1, okay? So, if I invest in Disney, it's going to be 2% plus 1.1, say we use the implied premium, 6%. So it's going to be 2% plus 6.6. So let's just say for Disney, we have expected return of Disney is 8.8%, okay? Then we have to check, we can check this against performance. So I'm going to go to Yahoo Finance and I'm going to see, last year, did Disney stock price go up by 8 point whatever percent? Or did it go down? Or how did, the, how did Disney do? So I go to Yahoo Finance, I type in Disney, and here in Disney, we can find uh, key statistics. Okay, so here we have 52 week change. Disney stock price is up 40% in one year. Okay, Would you, are you sorry you didn't invest in Disney last year? Yeah. You could have made 40%, right? The S&P is up 15% in the last year, okay? As all of the stocks in the market, okay? So generally the stock market is up 15%. So do you think Disney's managers are doing a good job? Yes, yeah, they Right, it could be they're doing a good job or just the entertainment sector in general is getting a lot of profit, right? So we said that Disney's expected return was 8.8%, right? So there's a way that we can measure how does the stock do compared to its expected return. And this number is called Jensen's Alpha. So, uh, Jensen's Alpha, we don't have to know where we get it from because this is financial theory, right? It was uh, some theory made in 1968. Okay, a little bit complicated. But again, we can, it's a number from the regression. One of the numbers we get when we do the regression. Because in the regression, we're putting Disney's returns, we're putting the S&P 500 returns, we're calculating Disney's beta. So we can see, did Disney's stock price go up in the past or go down in the past? So we can get this number, Jensen's Alpha. Okay? And this will tell us, uh, basically, 
Disney did better than it expected. <coughs> so this is what mutual fund managers are looking for. You can find some internet sites called Seeking Alpha. Do you understand Alpha? Alpha and Beta are Greek characters, right? They use Greek characters in finance. So Alpha looks like this, right? This is this kind of a <coughs> thing, right? <coughs> so Alpha is just telling us, did our stock do better than we expected or worse than we expected, okay? So this is why we pay uh, mutual fund managers, okay? We want mutual fund managers to pick stocks, buy stocks for us, which can do better than they, we expected, okay? Because if we have expected return is equals to risk, then we are taking we are taking a risk and we are getting a return, right? What we want is a, a fund manager who's able to make a better return for the risk we took. Okay? And this is like Jensen's Alpha. Did we make a better return than the risk that we took? But if we look at the last uh, five years, it's not easy to find this Jensen's Alpha. So Warren Buffet made a bet with some fund managers. Warren Buffet said to the fund managers, I bet that the S&P 500, the 500 biggest stocks in the US, will perform better than your funds over the next five years. So, the, who do you think won the bet? Which was better? The fund managers who are trying to pick the stocks, which they thought like Disney, oh Disney is doing better than the market, so I'll pick Disney, right? I'll pick another stock and another stock, okay? This is a fund, mutual fund manager. They just pick the stocks which they think will perform well, okay? Warren Buffet prefers to invest in uh, exchange traded fund like the S&P 500, the 500 biggest companies. I also prefer to invest in the ETF. It's low, cheaper fees because if you invest in the mutual fund, you have to pay 3, 2 or 3% fees to the fund manager. Why? Because they're trading stocks all the time. Right? They're buying and selling stocks all the time. But if you invest in the S&P 500, it's a very low fee, just 0.5%. Why? They're not trading the stocks. You just bought this stock and you're leaving for a long time. Okay? So which one do you think did better? The mutual fund managers who are trading the stocks or Warren Buffet who just invested in the S&P 500? Which one? Who won the bet? He bet $1 million with some of his friends who are fund managers. So Warren Buffet won the bet, okay? The S&P 500 performed better than the managed funds, the mutual funds, okay? So the point is that it's not easy to find this, pick the stocks who are going to perform better than the market, okay? So just let's uh, discuss this question with our partner. If you did this analysis on every stock listed on an exchange, what would the average Jensen's Alpha be across all stocks? So Jensen's Alpha is like, uh, did it do better than the market or worse than the market? Okay, so excuse me, can you close the door at the back of the room please? <coughs> yeah, with the lock, thank you. Yes, so... Uh, we're going to have uh, some stocks which are doing better than the market and some stocks which are doing worse than the market, okay? So discuss with your partner. For every, we analyze every stock on the market. Is it doing better, is it doing worse? What's its Jensen's alpha? Better than we expected or worse than we expected? Disney last year, if we just look at one year, did better than expected, right? So what would the average Jensen's alpha be across all stocks? It depends on whether the market went up or down. It should be zero or it should be greater than zero. So discuss with your partner.
Okay, so let's have a show of hands. Who thinks that it depends on whether the market went up or down? Who thinks it should be zero? Who thinks it should be greater than zero because stocks tend to go up more often than down? Okay, so Jensen's Alpha is saying whether the stock performed better or worse than expected, okay? So we expect Disney, let's say we expect it to go up 8%, okay? 8.8%. But we expect the S&P 500, we expect will go up 8%, okay? Then let's take another stock, like Apple. Let's say Apple, we expect it to go up 7.2%, okay? So, uh, yes, can you lock the door with the lock, please, at the back? Yes, the students shouldn't leave during the class time. Okay, thank you. So, we have uh, two stocks in the S&P 500. So we expect the S&P 500, let's just say we have just two stocks here. Make it easier. We have the S&P 2. Okay, just Disney and Apple. Okay? So we expect that the market will go up 8%, the average of the two stocks. Okay? So if uh, Disney goes up by 30%, okay? and Apple goes up by 20%, then the market went up by 25%. Okay? So, <coughs> Disney uh, did better than we expected, and Apple did better than we expected, but they didn't do better than the market, the average on the market. Okay? So, Jensen's Alpha is just telling us relatively, relatively how they did. So, if the market goes up a lot and your stock goes up a lot, you didn't do relatively that well, right? Let's say that Disney went up by 20% and Apple went up by 30%, right? In this case, uh, the market went up by 25%, right? It looks like Apple went up was we expected 8% and it went up 20%. But would you say that Disney's managers were doing a good job here or not? No. No, right? The market went up 25%. And the stocks that we expected to go less than Disney went up more than Disney. Okay? So the Jensen's alpha is relative. So the answer is it should be zero. Okay? So, some stocks did better than we expected. We're comparing with the market, right? Some stocks did better than we expected, and some stocks did worse than we expected. But in the end, it should be the average of the market. Okay? We're comparing against... What we're comparing managers against, financial managers against, is the average of the market. The market went up this much, 
Did we do better than we expected or worse than we expected? So in the end, all the stocks, if we invest in every stock in the portfolio, some stocks do better than the market, some stocks do worse, right? Overall, it's going to be zero. So just we need to understand about Jensen's alpha is kind of a measurement of, uh, can also be a measurement of performance. How is our financial manager or company performing? So Disney, between 2004 and 2008, it has a positive Jensen's alpha of 5.62% a year. So Disney stock was performing better than we thought. So the average was not 8%, it was 13% or 14% over 2004 to 2008. So what do you think? Is this a sign that the management is doing a good job? True or false? So we expected Disney to make an average of 8% a year between 2004 and 2008, but Disney actually made 14% a year between 2004 and 2008, average. So do you think this is a sign the management is doing a good job? So hands up who says true? <coughs> This is a sign management is doing a good job. True. Who says false? False. So why did you say false? Hmm? You're just scratching your head? Good excuse. <laughs> so this time let's see. Everybody needs to put up their hand. Okay, what do you think? Hands up who says true? True. The management is doing a good job. Hands up who says false? Okay, only five people put up their hands. Okay, so I think I need to explain the question again. <laughs> Jensen's alpha is showing that Disney performed better than we expected. Did the stock perform better than we expected? So let's say that in 2004, expected return for Disney was 8%. Do you understand expected return? Yeah. Yes? Okay. This was an expected return. Then, we can look back now, okay? Is our expected return always the same as the real return or actual return? No. no. It can be better or worse. So the actual return for Disney was 14, let's say, they say 5.62, so 13.62%, okay? <coughs> this was the average Return. So that's quite good, right? I would be happy enough to invest in Disney. The, expect, the actual return was higher than the risk. The risk in Disney was about 8%, right? Hurdle rate. But Disney stock went up 13.2%. Okay, do you understand that? Yeah. So what do you think? Does this mean the management is doing a good job? True or false? Hands up for true. The management is doing a good job. Everybody has to put up your hand. Either true or false. Hands up for true. Hands up for false. Okay, why do you say false? Yes, Jensen's Alpha, we explained in the last part, the Jensen's Alpha includes if the market goes up. So we're comparing to the average of the market. So the market goes up, Jensen's Alpha is also including this, this part. Yeah. So it could be false if the sector, that sector, entertainment sector, had a boom, right? Do you understand? So if there was a boom in the entertainment sector and the other entertainment companies all suddenly started doing very well, then it might not be true, right? But generally it's going to be true, right? It's going to be true, yes. They did do a good job, okay? But the only time it could be false is maybe just people started watching more movies, right? Or buying more toys. So all the companies in the movie and toy industry was making big profits, right? So we could compare it to that kind of industry. But generally, Jensen's alpha shows us that the manager is doing well. Okay. So, 
Yes? Uh, the expected return we calculate today, then the actual return we said that we get the stock price minus stock price plus dividends minus stock price zero over stock price. This is how we get a percent. Do you know that equation? This is the equation for calculating return, right? It's uh, stock price one, okay, plus dividends over minus stock price zero over uh, stock price zero. So it's easier if you look at an example, okay? Disney stock was uh, forty dollars, stock price zero, okay, forty, forty, okay. Disney stock is now 80, okay? Disney stock paid me three dividends, okay? So that's 80 plus three minus 40, okay? So that equals 43 over 40. So that's 100 and something, 106%, 107%, okay? 43 over 40 is 107%, something like that. So the return on Disney stock was 107%. Does that make sense? It was worth 40, it's now worth 80. And I got some dividends. So the stock price went up 100%. Well, I mean, like, Jensen's alpha was just given with that figure without giving me, like, stock price, dividend, dividends, or anything else. How do you know it's going to be better than the expected figure? Uh, we, it's a complicated equation that comes out of the regression. So we have this regression, right? Where we also put in the S&P 500, the market, the details for how the market did every month, how our stock did every month, okay? So you don't have to know how, how we find Jensen's Alpha, right? All you have to know is that you can use the Bloomberg service, you can put in the time range you want to put in, the name of the company, the time range, okay? We don't have to go and write down all these stock prices and returns. Somebody has already done that, they've made a computer software program, and we just put in the Disney here, S&P index here, the dates here, we get our regression. And then we can see our beta, our R squared, and our Jensen's alpha, okay, on the side. So it's, it's a, it's a, we need to use a software program, is the answer. So don't worry about how to get the Jensen's alpha, okay, just we want to know what it means, okay. Uh, and that it exists, we can have a measure, a percentage which shows us did it, was our returns on our stock better than expected or worse than expected? Okay, they call this uh, Jensen's Alpha. Okay, so any more questions? <coughs> So here was, uh, we finished the last time, we said that for Disney, if we calculate in 2009, uh, the risk-free rate was 3.5%, the page of Disney in 2009 was 0 0.95, and here he's using the implied, we're using the implied premium of 6%, okay, forward-looking premium, calculating the returns in the future. What do we guess the returns are going to be in the future? using a net present value, okay? And we see that Disney's expected return is 9.2% for 2009 or 2010. So this is number is two things. It's, it could be the expected return, the pro, it's the expected money we're going to get, right? But it's, all, it's like a hurdle rate. We're not going to invest in Disney unless we get we think We think Disney are going to make these profits. Okay, so in the forward-looking implied premium, we were guessing what profit is Disney going to make in the future, and then making this into a net present value, and saying that 9.2%. Uh, so discuss this question with your partner. As a potential investor in, D in Disney, what does this 9.2% tell you? 
This is the return I can expect to make in the long term on Disney if the stock is correctly priced and this model that we're using, the capital asset price model, is the right model. This is the return that I need to make on Disney in the long term to break even. Do you understand to break even? Yes. Break even, what does it mean? Okay, so if I start a restaurant and it costs me uh, $2,000 to start the restaurant, then every year I make $500 profit. What year am I going to break even? Hmm? Year four, right? Just a simple way. I, it costs me $2,000 to set up, I make $500 every year. I break even, okay, in year four. So this is the return I need to make to break even on my investment, or both. So discuss with your partner. So I'm going to hand around the attendance list, so uh, just check your name and write your group number if you have a group number. Okay, some groups already wrote their number. Then at the break time, if you didn't put your name down as a group number, at the break time I will uh, randomly assign you to a group, okay, during the break. So just write a number next to your name. If you have a group, if not, I'll do that in the break time, okay? Then uh, don't check the name of anybody who's absent, because today we're organizing the groups. So if you check the name of somebody who's absent, will be clear that they're not here, okay? So, uh, hands up who thinks the first one. Second one, both, both. Okay, so again, let's have a show of hands. You need to choose one, the first one, the second one, or both. So nobody put their hands up over here. I want you to guess, even if you don't know the answer, right? The reason I'm asking the question, it might be a difficult question, but I want you to think about it. It's okay if you make a mistake, okay? It's not an easy question. I just want, if I just tell you the answer, maybe you don't listen as much. But if you have to think about it and guess, then you think about it, then you can remember the answer better, okay? So I want you to guess. So let's try again. Who, who guesses the first answer? Who guesses the second answer? Who guesses the third answer? Okay, so that both of them are correct, the third answer. Okay? So, it's the return we want to make in the long term on Disney, 9% a year. Okay? It's also the return that I need to make on Disney to break even. If I don't make 9%, <laughs> then uh, it's not worth the risk that I invested in the stock. Okay. So, next question. Assume that you are an active investor and your research suggests that you're going to get 12.5% a year in Disney on the next five years. We expect you did your own research, right? You did your own research and you think Disney is going to make a 12.5% return, right? But based on this CAPM, the return is 9.2%, right? What do you think? Are you going to buy the stock or sell the stock? <laughs> so, 
So the, we have expected return of 9.2% a year. You have other information that Disney is going to get 12% a year on the next five years. What are you going to do? Save. Right, hands up who says buy the stock. Hands up who says sell the stock. Okay, you're going to do nothing. Okay, so in this case, this is what we're measuring, right? We're measuring our expected return. So if this is higher than our expected return, then yes, we're going to buy the stock. Okay? This is like more reward than the risk we're taking. So we can also use this inside the company. Managers in the company can use this. So we know that our stock investors want our, us to make a 9.2% profit to break even, or else they're not going to invest in our company. So this can be a hurdle rate for projects. If we're just looking from the equity standpoint, later we'll talk about both equity and debt, right? But just from the point of equity, from the stockholder, we can use this as a, as a hurdle rate. <coughs> so Disney's, this is Disney's cost of equity. Disney, in order to raise money, to get money, Disney is going to have to give 9.2% a year to the stockholders. Okay? So that's what they expect to get from Disney. So. <coughs> Uh, you are advising a very risky software firm on the right cost of equity to use in project analysis. You estimate a beta of 3 for the firm. Does that make sense for a software firm, a high beta? Yes. Software firms are more risky or less risky? More risky. More risky. So it has a high beta, right? So uh, we come up so we have 3. If you put 3 in the equation, it's going to multiply by a lot, right? 3 sixes is 18. So we come up with a cost of equity of 21.5%. So this company needs to make a profit. We have to expect this software company is making a profit of 21.5% a year. Otherwise, we're not going to invest in that company. Okay? If you look at Facebook, when it was just a startup, Facebook was a very risky con company. Okay? Are you going to invest your money in Facebook or Disney? If they have the same, if Facebook tells you, next year I can make a profit of 9%, are you going to invest in Facebook or Disney? Disney. But Facebook is just starting up, it's very risky, you could lose all your money, right? If you invest in stock, you're an owner of the company, so stock price can go down. Okay? So you want, if Facebook tells you, I can make a profit of 50% next year and you believe that, then maybe you'll invest there, right? Or in the future, they can make that kind of profit. The stock price will go up. So, <clears throat> the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer of the company, is concerned about the high cost of equity, and wants to know whether there's anything he can do to lower his beta, okay? So, how do you bring down your beta? What do you think? So discuss with your partner. The beta is 3, it's very high, right?
So does anybody have any idea about how to reduce the beta? Yes? Pay off debt, right? If you have a lot of debt, your company is more risky, right? Does that, we talked about that at the very start with the restaurant. You start a restaurant with a 100% loan, you have to pay interest every month. You start the restaurant with your own money, you don't, okay? That's one way, another way? Diversification. Diversification, right? Change to another business. Diversify to a less risky business, okay? Another way? Another way is just keep more cash in your business, right? Uh, sell assets or keep more cash in your business. But bring down the beta. Uh, so those are the three main ways, okay? But the next question is, do you want to bring down your beta? Yes or no? Should you focus your attention on bringing down the beta? Yes or no? So yes, why? Is, is a lower beta always a good thing? Hmm? What does it depend on? Okay, so it depends, right? If we have a good profitable opportunity, if we are going to make 50% profit next year by selling software, we don't have to worry about bringing our beta down. Okay? So, a high beta means it's a high risk but also high opportunity. So it depends on our company. We think that by selling this software we can make a lot of money. Okay? We know it's risky. We are prepared to accept the risk in order to make a big profit. Okay? So it depends on, on your situation. Generally, it's true that companies prefer low beta. They want, especially if they have a lot of employees, they want to have a stable situation for their employees. But uh, especially the young company, a young company might not be that concerned. They don't have many employees, right? The other employees are also taking a chance. They know they're taking a chance, taking a risk. And they want to make a big profit. So they want to make, to make more risk, take more risk. So, uh, there are other companies that we can... Uh, also, we mentioned before about uh, other companies. This is a company in India, Tata Chemicals. So here we write in, it's the same software program. Bloomberg is global, global software program. We write in the name of the company, Tata Chemicals. We're using the Indian index, the Indian market, not the S&P 500. In India, we have the Sensex index. Okay, probably doesn't have as many stocks as 500 as the US, but still has a large number of stocks. So this company, the beta is 1.18. Okay, Jensen's Alpha is minus 0.44%. It's doing a little bit worse than, than uh, uh, normal, right? So here we can see beta. I don't know if you can read, it says here alpha. Okay, it tells you the alpha. Here it says R squared. Okay, so uh, R squared is 0.56, alpha minus 0 0.435. Okay. Uh, it also tells us the standard error. So in this case, uh, we, we can also calculate for this company. We already calculated for India earlier in the course. Uh, we made some uh, country risk for India. So we see that India's risk free rate is 4% plus uh, their beta 1.8 okay, plus this was 6% was the US implied premium okay but we calculated for India India's stocks are more volatile more risky than US stocks so we added the country risk of 4.5 so this will be 10.5, okay? So the total for this company is 19.4%. So if I'm going to invest in Tata Chemicals, I want them to make a profit of 20% a year. Does that make sense? It's riskier than Disney, 
the Indian, it's an Indian company, the Indian economy is riskier than the US economy. Okay? The Indian stock market is, is more volatile than the US stock market. So if I invest in India, not in the US, I want to have a higher profit opportunity. Otherwise I'm not going to invest there. So this is reflected in, we already calculated uh, this is in, there's higher inflation in India. This is inflation plus the real interest rate. Okay, so it's four percent. And then here we have the country risk premium. Okay, four point five one for India. <clears throat> so we can do this for any company. Okay, and then we we know how to calculate our risk free rate, and we know how to calculate the risk premium. We put that into the equation and it will tell us the beta. Then we get the beta and we uh, find our expected return. Okay. So do you have any questions on, on this part so far? Finding the beta with regression? <clears throat> if you have questions it's good to ask because probably other students have similar question as you. Okay, then let's take a break now for 10 minutes. Where is the attendance list? Where is the attendance list? Here. Okay, uh, then how did, where has the attendance list gone? Just how many people have signed the attendance hand up? It did move very fast, very slowly. Uh, okay, then just during the break time, Right. If you have a group, write it on the attendance list. Okay. Write the number of your group. Yes. I, I, 